This is Pastor Bob Yandy, and whenever the rapture comes, we're going to have a great harvest day. That which was planted will be raised from the dead, and us who are alive and remain will be instantly changed into a resurrection body. What do we do until then? Well, we don't bury Christians, we plant them. Sound good? We've got more to come today. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Last week and this week, I have been teaching on the subject of resurrection. And in fact, an entire chapter of the New Testament is dedicated to the subject of resurrection. And we have been going through it verse by verse. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And he spoke it to the Corinthians who did not believe that a uh, new body was going to come. In fact, with their religion from Socrates and Plato, they believed that the body was evil and that the person on the inside, the spirit man or the soul was a perfect person, a great person needed to be liberated and death liberated you. And so from that time on, you floated across the river Styx into the Elysian fields, and there you stayed forever and forever. But when Paul began to teach them they were going to have a resurrection body, many rebelled. And they said, we didn't want that. How could, how could God do something so evil to us? And some even regretted being born again. But Paul now is cleaning this whole issue up with this chapter and basically just teaching them, God doesn't give you something that's bad. If you'll just be quiet for a moment, just shut up and listen, you'll understand the resurrection body is something incredible. This resurrection body is nothing like the body you have. And yes, you're partly right. The body you have now is evil. It is corrupt. It was corrupted because it's made of the dust of the ground and the dust of the ground received a curse when Adam died. Therefore, everything made of dust received a curse. So plants, animals, birds, trees, everything that was made out of dust took that on in us too. Our physical body came from dust. So we've been redeemed from the inside out. Our spirit was first of all born again. Our soul or our mind is being renewed day by day. But the last thing that's gonna be taken care of will be the physical body. And the physical body will change just as fast as the spirit did at the moment of the new birth. And that is we will be changed in a moment, the twinkling of an eye. That's what's gonna happen at the rapture. Atomo is the Greek word there, meaning instantaneous, a time period that cannot be further divided. That's how quick the body's gonna be changed. And that's how fast our spirit was changed at the new birth. Go with me to verse 51. We're heading down through the ending of this chapter. And Paul says here, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Verse 52, in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible. That's those Christians who have died and gone on to be with the Lord in heaven. And we, the ones who are alive right now, will be changed. I want you to go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're just going to take a look at some scriptures dealing with this one. Because literally after Jesus was resurrected and taken to heaven, the next resurrection that's going to occur is us, the church. There's been so far 2,000 years separating this. And should the Lord not come for another? Another time period. It might be 2,100 years, 2,200 years. I don't know, but it's going to happen. There has been no resurrection since Jesus went to heaven, and we will be the next one. After that will be a number of resurrections up until the last one, which will be Old Testament and and, and New Testament uh, time periods. Those who didn't receive Jesus, all sinners will be resurrected to stand before the great white throne judgment of God. First Thessalonians chapter four. I want you to take a look with me at verse 13 through 18. And here, Paul is talking to the Thessalonians about the rapture, of which he's now gonna be talking to the Corinthians about the rapture. And he says, I would not have you ignorant brethren concerning those who are asleep. That is New Testament believers who have died and gone on to be with the Lord. Now they're really not asleep. It's just an analogy. If a person is asleep, they will come back and wake up. The wake up call will be the trumpet of God and Jesus Christ coming back. And all those who have been in the grave physically in heaven, spiritually, Chapter 12 of Hebrews says that they are the just spirits of just men made perfect in heaven. So when you die, your spirit man goes to heaven, your body stays in the ground. And he simply refers to that as sleeping. There is no such thing as soul sleep. Your soul's alive in heaven, your spirit's alive in heaven. He goes on to say concerning those who are asleep that you do not sorrow as others who have no hope. 
The others who sorrow that have no hope are first of all sinners because they have no hope, but next of all Christians who just don't understand or believe in the rapture of the church or any coming end time events. Some believe we're gonna be here and go through the tribulation, that's no hope, but the Bible confirms we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we all shall be changed in a moment, the twinkling of an eye. Verse 14 goes on to say, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so those who are asleep in Jesus, again, church age believers in heaven, will God bring with him, that's with Jesus. When Jesus comes back for those that are alive on the earth, he's also gonna bring back all those from the day of Pentecost on who accepted him as Lord and Savior. And they have been in heaven for a hundred years, 200 years, a thousand years, 1500 years. They've been in heaven all that time. They're gonna come back with Jesus and they again will be, they'll come and meet us on the earth. They will receive a resurrection body made out of their old body from the dust of the ground, but our body will be instantaneously changed from a natural body into a resurrection body. And this will all happen to us at the same time. Verse 15 goes on to say, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord. In other words, this this isn't something we plucked out of thin air. This isn't some strange doctrine from some other religion. We say this to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, that's the rapture, will not prevent. The Greek word means precede. We will not precede those who are asleep. We don't get ours first and rise up, then they get theirs and rise up right behind us. No, we're all gonna rise together at the same time. And even though we are alive on the earth, doesn't mean we have some kind of monopoly over those who died. The Lord loves us all the same because we're all part of the same body. I brought this out yesterday in the broadcast when I talked about the fact that we're all part of the same family, but the family's divided. For this cause, I bow my knee to the Father of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. The family's divided. The family, the whole family's divided between those in heaven, those on earth, but somehow we must all come together so we can all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 16 goes on to say here in 1 Thessalonians chapter four, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we be ever with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. When I attended Trinity Bible College, Brother Duncan used to tell us, he said, really, there's honestly, there is no more scripture left to be fulfilled before the rapture of the church. Even Paul thought in his day, he was going to see the rapture of the church. He said, we who are alive and remain and included himself in that. And so he simply said, there is really no scripture left to be fulfilled. He said, the only thing I can see in the word that has to be fulfilled before Jesus Christ comes back is the shout. And that shout is what we're listening for. And so the shout will come from Jesus Christ. The trumpet of God's going to be there, the voice of the archangel. We're gonna to rise to meet Jesus in the air along with all those who have died before us. And finally, finally, the whole family will be together in heaven around the throne of God. And then we will go all go through the judgment seat of Christ. Then all of us will come back as the bride of Christ at the battle of Armageddon and watch Jesus Christ mop up this mess down here on this earth. And then the whole earth will be renovated. So that'll be the millennial reign of Jesus Christ for a thousand years. Take a look with me at 2 Thessalonians chapter two. I wanna take a look at verses one through eight. And here Paul is again, because the book of First and Second Thessalonians is really dedicated to the coming of the Lord. Where we're studying one chapter in First Corinthians 15 on resurrection, the subject of the resurrection of the church, the rapture, occupies two books that Paul wrote because much false doctrine had come into Thessalonica concerning the rapture of the church. So it says in Second Thessalonians chapter two, verses one through eight, we beseech you brothers, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together to him. This indicates he's talking about the rapture of the church, not the second coming of the Lord to the earth to set up his kingdom. This is just for the church to take us out of the way. The reason why we're taken out of the way, there's a number of things, but the whole earth when the church is gone is gonna shift back to Jewish time for seven more years. The 70th week of Daniel is another name for the tribulation. Another reason why is because the church cannot be here 
is because we have not been appointed under wrath, as is also brought out in Thessalonians. And so God's wrath will be poured out on the earth. But a third reason is there has to be a short even if it's a one second break in time where there are no believers on the earth and then suddenly there's the first believer on the earth after the rapture. In that small period of time is when Antichrist can show himself. The Bible tells us in this verse of scripture, and we'll take a look at here in just a moment, is that Antichrist can't show himself as long as we're here. As long as there's one Christian on the earth, he can't show himself, but God removes all of us. And for that split second is a time when suddenly Antichrist can be here and start his seven year reign. After he shows himself, then the first believer happens. And that first believer will be part of the 144,000 that will be saved out of the nation of Israel, 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes. So let's take a look at that verse of scripture again. Second Thessalonians chapter two, we're gonna take a look at verses one through eight. We beseech you brothers by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together to him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled. And they were shaken in mind, they were shaken and troubled, just like people are today because of all the false people rising up, teaching twisted and perverted things about about the coming, or as they would say, the non-coming of the Lord. Because it's not only taught that part of you is gonna stay here and there'll be a second part of the resurrection in the middle of the tribulation of believers from the church age. And even some saying, no, there is no rapture at all. And that we're gonna subdue the earth so that Jesus can come back at the end of it. It's simply saying here, don't be soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit. That's as if that there's a spirit coming out and there's prophets of the Holy Spirit coming. Don't believe it. If a person stands up and say, thus saith the Lord, but it contradicts the Bible. If it contradicts the Bible, it is not the spirit of the Lord. It is not the Holy Spirit, it is an evil spirit. And we are living in a day when there are lying signs and wonders and lying prophets standing up, trying to tell us all these things and that there is no rapture of the church. There is a rapture of the church. It is the great hope of the church. That you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, somebody's preaching it, or by letter, as from us. There was even a false epistle to the Thessalonians being circulated that said it was from Paul, and Paul said, I did not write any such thing. Why would I write something to contradict what I had said before? One of them has to be incorrect. He said, the one that's being sent to you that's incorrect is by the hands of men, not by the hands of God. He goes on to say, as the day of Christ is at hand. Uh -uh. The Greek says that the day of Christ is here. You poor suckers have missed the rapture of the church and you are now in the tribulation yourself. This will not happen. We pointed out already that those who are dead in Christ will rise first and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together and we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we shall all be in heaven. The family will be reunited. So there's no way here part of the church can be taken and part of the church left behind. Listen to me very carefully. If it's possible for part of the church to be left behind because they're carnal, then listen, throughout the past 2,000 years, those who come back to get a resurrection body, some will have to get their old bodies back and go through the part of the tribulation or all the tribulation, as this group does, because there have been carnal people taken to heaven when they died. Carnal and, and spiritual Christians all go to heaven when they die. It'll all be handled at the judgment seat of Christ. But to say part of them down here has to go through the tribulation, think about this. If you were lucky enough to be born one day before the rapture and you were carnal, you got to go to heaven. So that's not at all what it is. God's going to be fair with everyone because even a carnal Christian is stronger than the power of Satan on this earth to bring in Antichrist. They all have to be removed for Satan to do this. Let no man deceive you, verse three, by any means for that day, that is the day of the rapture, will not come except they're a falling away Pre uh, happen first. Oh, well, that's what's happening today. Churches are not preaching the gospel. I hear people say this. So this is the falling away. No, the Greek word for falling away is the Greek word apostasia. Apostasia simply means a departure. So apostasy is usually used in the negative form, like they departed from, from Moses or they departed from the living God. And so it's always used in the negative mainly, but here it's used in a different way. And the word just simply means departure. And here's how Wiest translates it in his, in his Bible. It says here in that verse of scripture that that day shall not come, that is the day of the tribulation cannot come except first of all, the departure occurs first. The departure, and he says it this way, the, the aforementioned departure of the church is found in verse one. He says, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, he says the day of the tribulation cannot come till that occurs first. So they're teaching in Paul's day 
day. We are in the tribulation. It's impossible. We're all still here. The departure of the church has to happen first, and it is translated, sadly, in your King James as falling away. The Greek word again means departure. The departure shall happen first. Then that man of sin will be revealed. That's Antichrist, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? I'm not telling you anything different now than I told you then. Between the last visit and this visit, false doctrine, false prophets have arisen, and my message is verbatim exactly the same as the first time I came to you. The point of it is, is once you understand the word and the simplicity of the rapture of the church and the simplicity of how it falls into God's timing simply means we're not going to change. You can have all these people standing up saying, thus saith the Lord, but if it doesn't line up with the word of God, it is not the Lord I serve that's speaking to them. Verse six goes on to say, now you know what hinders that he, Antichrist, might be revealed in his time. The he who hinders here is the body of Christ. And so it goes on to say in verse seven, for the mystery of iniquity is already at work. Even in the day of, of Paul, the underground working of Satan behind the scenes in government, all that was already at work. Only he who now hinders, that's the church, that is the body of Christ, will hinder until he be taken out of the way. Then will that wicked one, that is Antichrist, be revealed. He can't be revealed till we're gone, whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth at the day when he comes back at the battle of Armageddon and destroy him with the brightness of his coming. All this is brought out in Revelation 19 and following and many verses of the Old Testament, also Matthew chapter 24. So Philippians chapter three, verses 20 and 21 says this, our conversation, huh, the Greek word is citizenship, our citizenship is in heaven. You know what? I'm in the world, not of it. My citizenship changed the moment I accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. And my citizen for the United States now only is for my body. My body's not gonna go to heaven, it's gonna stay here. So as far as a citizen of, of earth, just this physical body, but the real me on the inside, my citizenship is in heaven. In other words, I have a home I've never been to. My home country is a place I haven't gone to yet, but will. And so our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will change our vile body, that's our natural body, the cursed body that might be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. We'll continue when we come back right after this message. When a Christian has passed away, we do not bury them. We plant them for a future harvest. One day, all Christians will put on a resurrection body. Our earthly bodies carry the image of Adam, but our resurrection bodies will carry the image of Jesus. One day, we will have bodies that will possess everlasting life. In this exciting six-part series based on 1 Corinthians 15, Pastor Bob Yandian provides a detailed study of the future resurrection of every born-again believer. Messages include a foundation doctrine, what if there is no resurrection? What is baptism for the dead? Sowing, reaping, and resurrection. Our incorruptible body and the exception generation. To order resurrection, visit our website at bobyendian.com. I've been waiting on this book, Theology Simplified. This is a class I teach at Karis Bible College. And it's my favorite class. I think the student's favorite class is there. And I've been waiting to put this into a book. It's eight different theological terms that sound difficult, but actually are very simple. I just simply think the Bible sometimes is filled with complicated sounding words, but you break it down, it becomes very simple. This book is called Theology Simplified. Let me tell you what all that covers. It covers predestination. It covers reconciliation and sanctification. It covers glorification, justification. Redemption, propitiation, and election are all covered in this book. And again, big words with simple meanings. I bring it down to you. When I used to pastor at the church, I would even tell, I'd say, housewives, you that are listening out there today in the congregation, this is designed for you too. The Word of God is not difficult. Go to my website, bobbyandian.com. You'll find how you can have a copy for yourself. Blessings upon blessings to you. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. 
Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Back to our verses we're discussing on the rapture of the church. Colossians chapter three and verse four says this, when Christ who is our life will appear. Notice not when he comes to the earth and stays there. No, he appears in the sky. Then will you also appear with him in glory. That's the glory of God where Jesus comes back and we will be transformed in that glory into a resurrection body. First John chapter three, verses one through three. John says to us, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, but it does not yet appear what we will be. For we know that when he will appear, we will be like him. We'll have a resurrection body just like his, for we will see him as he is, not as he was, but as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Knowing that the rapture of the church is coming does not make us want to sin, but to live righteously. This whole thing about, well, if I thought Jesus was coming soon, I'd just go live like the devil. I can guarantee you, if I came on this broadcast and this was live, this is being videoed, but just suppose I came on live and said, I have to interrupt everything. Jesus came to me last night and during the night woke me up and told me he's coming back Wednesday at 12 o'clock noon central time. I mean, and that was only like two more days from now. Let's just suppose I said that you wouldn't go, well, I can go sin. Let's go run our credit cards up and buy a car. You only have two days to drive it. I'll tell you what you'd be doing. You'd be on the phone trying to get people saved. Your mom and dad that you haven't witnessed to for some time, your brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles, you'd be doing your best to get them saved saying, listen, I know that Jesus said he didn't know the day or the hour, but God the Father told him and he told Bob, his best friend, when he's coming back. So I know the rapture's coming. You would be on the, and you'd be running around trying to get everybody saved. Listen, it could be before Wednesday when Jesus is coming back. We should constantly live with the knowledge he could come very, very soon. So again, knowing that the rapture is coming doesn't make us want to sin, but to live righteously. Knowing of the rapture of the church also produces a fervor in us to win the lost. Let's compare the rapture of the church to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The second advent, that is the second coming of Jesus to rule the earth, is primarily taught in the Old Testament, in the four gospels, and in the first chapter of Acts, where Jesus says to his disciples, as he went to heaven and an angel came back, as he spoke to them and left, then it says that they stood there watching, hoping something else would happen, but two angels stood by them and said, he's gonna come back in like manner as you've seen him go. He's gonna come back and touch this very same spot and that would not be the rapture of the church because he won't touch the earth. That is the second coming of the Lord. This will happen when Jesus comes back, stand on that same spot and he will become the ruler of the earth for a thousand years. Zechariah chapter 14 tells us this in verses four and five. His feet will stand in that day on the Mount of Olives, which is by Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will split in the middle toward the east and the west. And there will be a very great valley. Half of the mountain will be moved toward the north, half of it toward the south. And you shall flee to the valley of the mountains for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. You will flee like you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and my God will come with him and all the saints with you. So at the rapture, Jesus comes for his saints. At the second coming, he'll come back with his saints. At the rapture, Jesus appears in the sky, but the second coming, Jesus actually touches the earth. At the rapture, only the saints see and hear him, but at the second coming, every eye will see him every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he's Lord. The rapture begins a time of judgment on the earth, but the, but the second coming begins a time of peace on the earth. At that time, the Mount of Olives will split and be cast into the sea. 
Let's go back to chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians and let's begin with verse 53. And here it's speaking again of the rapture of the church and what's going to happen to us. And these natural bodies that we have will be instantly changed into a resurrection body. But those who have died and gone to be with the Lord ahead of us will come back. And when they come back, they stand next to us. Their natural bodies will come back from the ground, dust, ashes, whatever it may be, and be transformed into a resurrection body. We will be just suddenly, instantly changed from a natural body to a resurrection body. Those who've gone to be with the Lord will come back and get a body made out of the dust of the ground, and all of a sudden, it will be changed into a resurrection body. It will no longer just be the dust of the ground. It will be spirit made tangible, a spiritual body, and they will be changed also. Verse 53 says this, for this corruptible, this is speaking of our natural body, must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible, will have put on incorruption, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will be brought to pass the saying that is written, a quote from Isaiah 25 and verse eight, death is swallowed up in victory. The final death that will be swallowed up will be physical death for the church. Later on, the whole earth will no longer experience physical death. Hosea chapter three and verse 14 is the subject of verse 55. Here in our passage of scripture, O death, where is your sting? And O grave, where is your victory? Verse 56, the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is in the law. Verse 57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 58, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast. This word means stabilized. Be stabilized. Unmovable means settled. You cannot be shaken. Always abounding or increasing in the work of the Lord. For you know, this is the key to everything, knowledge of the word of God, that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What have we been saying all this time? Folks, Jesus Christ is coming back soon. The great hope of the church. Why in the world are you depressed? Well, I watch the news. The news doesn't tell you what's gonna happen with Jesus. It doesn't tell you about the upcoming kingdom. And like I've said, many times on the news, you'll hear something, but by tomorrow it all changes. And you gotta keep watching it and watching to find out what's going on, hoping for something good. You don't have to hope for anything good in the word of God. It's filled with hope. And the great hope of the church is that Jesus Christ is coming back. And it could happen at any moment. Folks, my confidence is not in natural governments, even the government of the United States. I pray for it, pray for our leaders. As the word of God says in Ephesians, we pray for them for, for two things. Number one, to be saved, and number two, to come to the full knowledge of the truth. We pray for them for that. That is our call and mission to this earth, to take the gospel to the world and then also make disciples of them. That's how we should be praying for the leaders of our nation. Next of all, for revival. We're in the midst of revival right now. It's already started, but I can tell you this, it's gonna become even greater and greater in the days to come. And when the rapture occurs, that, that revival will just continue right on over to those who get saved during the tribulation because the Holy Spirit will be working throughout the entire world, bringing people to the Lord Jesus Christ through those who witness. And so here we have it again. What's his closing statement to us? Be stable, be settled, always increasing in the work of the Lord. For you know, knowledge is the key that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Keep witnessing for the Lord, keep that hope in Jesus Christ alive and begin to warn people even more and more the coming of Jesus is at hand. Even sinners today know there's something going on the earth and Jesus Christ for us is the answer to them. See you next time. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.